feel you immune. The sobering. My guts stank the next day, worse than fermented cabbage hash, and my head buzzes full of flies in the heat. I stumble into the kitchen and reach for a glass of water. Kite, sitting on the counter, curling her hair with the handle of a pot. These are new water glasses, I notice. She shrugs. You didn't rob an old lady on the way home last night, did you? I don't think so. I don't remember. That was some good liquor. Good? My guts stink like a highway. Like a kill ditch. And Jim practically smashed my skull open for me. Jim? She wrinkles her nose in distaste. That assistant? Yeah, I accidentally robbed him. Again. He's not so bad. He talked to me more about the cure. He gave me the batteries. You are so stupid about him and that cure. You have a thing for that guy or something? Gross. Anyway, thank you for robbing him and getting the batteries. The radio works great now, and those flyers that you nailed to yourself were brilliant. And I think that wearing a symbol of solidarity was the best idea that you've ever had. We should get some more orange fabric and tear it like this. She holds up a pile of orange t-shirt strips and run them through the printing press and then hand them out. Did you tear up my orange shirt? And don't you think people already know that selling girls is a bad idea and they just have no choice? Don't they really need a place to drop off family that they can't keep? And could they pick up fresh fish as food at the same time? We could build some schools and houses and clinics, I say. I hit my fist on the table with enthusiasm, making my coffee jump. She hits her fist mockingly on the counter and smiles down at me. You're even dumber with a hangover, Ophelia. Don't be so naive. That will never happen. All we have is knowledge better than theirs. Yes, I love knowledge, I agree. Like the knowledge that they could be eating fish instead of selling their daughters to buy food. Like that they could turn to scientists for medicine and Jim could keep us safe from the cure. If we said those things, everyone else would 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 say we... What? Cool. Wrote myself some really fun dialogue to read. If we said those things, everything else we say would be ridiculed and nobody would let us make any point at all, Kite yells. By who? Nobody's listening to us anyway. Maybe talking about fish would actually catch the ears of your precious radio hosts. Fine, Kite snaps. If you want to ruin our reputation before we even have one, why don't you go down to the river and catch some of those fish? I dare you. In fact, if you can catch some fish... I'll try your plan, but I'm going to go do something useful while you fail. She slams the apartment door behind her. I have no idea how to catch fish. I don't want to catch fish. They're disgusting. I don't want to eat one. I don't want to see those disgusting monsters on an otherwise beautiful armband. But they are safe, maybe, and free. Other people should eat them. If the fish aren't sick, if I can prove Kite's story true, and if I can prove my idea is cool. I very slowly tiptoe into Swan's old room. Everything is dusty and exactly where she left it. Her musty blankets are still dropped on the floor where she stood up out of them. I feel bad raiding her bookshelf, but she would have liked teaching girls to feed themselves, and I know which book I want. She has an old hunting guide. There are pictures and words, but I hardly need the pictures to decipher the instructions. The hook is easy to make, but the string is harder to find. A long, skinny piece with no snags. I have to make my pole out of a slender pipe instead of flexible wood, and I would love to have a reel. I get the shivers when I arrive at the grassy field by the open, forbidding beach and kneel uneasily at the water's edge. I look at the waving grass all around me, digging my fingers into the cold earth for worms. Except for the worms, the field is empty. 
The triangles of old swing sets sit perched, eroding on the edge of sandboxes, long ago robbed of their sturdy plank borders. Squirrels gnaw on twigs, mercilessly shaking flowered branches to build ever larger nests. Crows squawk and rip berries from the thorny bushes. I drop my fistful of soil in wriggling night crawlers. There are no humans here, no children to pick the ripe summer fruit. Only a zombie waving unsteadily on its foot on its feet across the ball diamond. I go to it and hold its hand. It is hardly the first it is the first zombie I have seen in almost weeks. Where have they all gone? I've hardly killed a zombie all summer, maybe one or two while we were walking to do other things. Are the zombies failing like the fish head? They are few to be seen. Most must be locked in their relatives' closets or decaying past the point of ambling. Not many new infections anymore. They've slowed, their wave of assault slowing, disappearing. Soon humans could be safe from more than just fish, especially if we can hunt down auctions and rangers and feed people. The zombie brings my hand to its mouth, but it has no teeth. Soft ruined gums pad at my skin, not tearing a hole, not moving its infection any further. I brace it softly against the green pillowy ground and give it a gentle splice through the forehead. It lies still. I close its eyes and fold its arms. The grass is growing. The water laps clear on the shore. The door to the safe house is open and unblocked when I arrive. Girls lounge about in their pajamas, munching on toast and crackers. I look at their heads. Many have cut their hair to mimic my short style. They beam up at me under their chopped, uneven halos of shorn fluff. Auntie Ophelia, I drew you a picture of a hammer. Ophelia, I spilled peas. Ophelia, Bernice took my shoe. I fold the picture into my pocket, mop at the green puddle with a rag, and sort out the exchange of a shoe for a missing pillow. One little girl with thin, straight blonde hair stands up on her chair, trying to hand me a picture of her and me with spiky hair. You don't look like her, her roommate hisses to her and tries to push her off the chair. I do too, the girl whispers vehemently and scoots her chair closer to me as I become swamped by a pool of girls collecting around my feet. Okay, okay, I raise my voice. We all look fantastic today. Where are Kite and Carlos? The crowd points to the office, which is unlit and locked. It looks empty. Okay, girls, I'll be back in five minutes, and we're all going outside. Get your shoes on. Their eyes turn to giant dinner plates. They don't move a muscle. I clap. Come on, don't be chickens. Be strong, girls. Let's go. The younger ones dive for their boots and flip-flops first, squealing and shrieking with glee. Girls old enough to be wary of going outside cautiously advise those who are not dressed to head for the bathroom and bathtubs, dripping and splashing on their way to the wardrobe. Some who haven't chopped off their locks spend time decorating themselves with plastic jewelry and fool's gold, wrapping glimmering chains around their ponytails as they have seen Kite do. Out of the din inside the office, Kite and Carlos sit around the printing press, holding their heads with their elbows propped next to the tall glasses which I sniff, golden liquor, mixed with vegetable juice and black pepper. You're wasting tomatoes on liquor? In the morning? I ask. Kite, your guts reek already. Carlos, the girls are all by themselves. The front door was wide open. They've got each other, Carlos slurs. That's not enough. Are you drunk already? Are you? Kite leers. I see you don't have any fish with you. No, I don't have any fish yet. I'm taking the girls to the park with me. It's better than them sitting inside all day with nobody training them, with their guardians wasting away, drunk. You go ahead and pretend that you are teenagers in a high rise with brilliant ideas. I'm going to go do something with these girls. Sylvia ran in through the open office door, her jet black curls tickling my nose, and she leaps into my arms with her blankie, only one shoe on, telling me she can't find the other. Her father finally feels the empty spot between his arms, where she has not jumped. We all glance at my arms to make sure I have no bare skin. Fishing? With the girls? But there are zombies and, and fish? 
Carlos stutters. Maybe we should just focus on the flyers. The flyers are cool, I say. Really great. But there aren't many zombies anymore. Not many new infections. There are far worse things in this world than zombies. And I will teach the girls to be safe so that they can help themselves. They have been helped. Carlos flushes. I've given them food and clothes and paper. What else could they possibly need? Family, I say. They need family and a life, training, fresh air, chances to fail and succeed. I'm willing to provide the parts you can't. Maybe you should put some science and food options on the next batch of flyers. Sure that my parents would have been proud of me. I wish there was a party. I, w <laughs> I would be like a party for mom. It would be like a party for mom. I'm sure that my parents would have been proud of me. It would be like a party for mom. I could teach just like dad. I lead Sylvia to the door with the other girls and lace up her second shoe. I point them through the reinforced exit that was left open, instructing Bernice to lead the way with her bow and arrow and to let Cherry preside over the middle, lugging a tub full of kitchen knives and a long-handled cooking pan. With my fishing pole in hand, I march them two by two to the park. They glance to their sides even more often than I do. They stay far from the water and the instinctively frightening fish, but they listen to my other instructions carefully. I set two girls on a large boulder to stand and keep lookout. With jokes about who can bite who and who's scarier in the morning, girls or fish, the rest roll up their sleeves and they follow me. At every new obstacle, a rabid squirrel, a dead and bloating squatter in the weeds, a lone zombie traipsing through the shrubs. When I do not flinch, they collect their strength too. We're all sick of ceding space to everyone who looks down on us. Bernice shoots three slavering and mange-ridden rodents with her arrows. Cherry shows a small band of girls how to wrap their shirts around their hands to drag a decaying body to a burn pile. And I demonstrate that even a frying pan can make out a, take out a slow-moving zombie that isn't half as strong as three girls with clenched teeth. There now, I say. The park is safe. We need to try to get fish. They howl. The fish are just as safe as the worms. Disgusting, for sure, I agree. But better food. They ooh and ah with horror and delight when I stab a worm through its puffy pink belly and twist it back on itself to be sure that it'll stay on the hook. They begin to dig through the grass and the soil to pluck some worms out for themselves. They fling them at each other. And they yell in terror and then tell themselves again and again that the worms aren't dangerous. Maybe the fish aren't either. It's funny to hear my words coming out of their mouths. They collect handful after handful of red crawlers, naming them and racing them against each other before placing them in an empty kin tin can. The girls are no longer the bait. I can take care of them. They can take care of themselves. We could all be cool and family. They stare at me, waiting for something more than worms. I force myself to the edge of the water, close enough to touch it, and the girls follow. Unafraid of the flotillas of scum floating in the ripples, a small insect scuttles over and under the surface of the water, darting beneath a large rock. Another follows it. I jump back. They're everywhere. I hadn't seen these insects. The girls took care of me. A pair of them, holding hands and skipping, run back to the trees on the far side of the park and grab a fresh branch. Disregarding the yellow leaves on the ends of the twigs, they hold it like a broom, raise it above their heads, and bring it crashing down on the evil arthropods hiding rocks. Satisfied, they have the branch down and peer into the shallows. The skittering insects have removed themselves to quieter ground. I smile at them, grateful. I wade into the weeds, up to my knees, and let the hook at the end of my pole jitter in my unsteady hands. 
When I feel a tug on the line, I fight the urge to scream and run. Instead, I jerk only the pole and walk calmly backwards, showing the girls how to think through panic. They make a path for me in the mysterious, thrashing creature that is following me. It is heavy. It flops against the rocks beneath the retaining wall. We all take a deep breath as it clears the stones, a dark, ashy black fish. It writhes and jerks and struggles and protests against the air. Its fleshy body flaps dangerously at us, trying to wring its head around and point its gaping mouth at each of us in turn. Its bulging eyes stare into nothingness. The gummy whiskers by its mouth curl in anticipation of something to eat. It's huge, the size of my forearm, but more plump. I pull my axe out of my belt. The girls scream as I approach the creature's bloated belly. It rolls over and turns its back to me. A zombie would never turn that way. It inches back towards the water, a healthy creature trying to escape. Oh, no, you don't, I smile. I chop it in half. It lays still. Bright pink meat stands out beneath its skin, with no hint of gray, with no hint of green. Its body is motionless, even though the head is still attached to one half. It can die without its brains being destroyed. It's definitely healthy, I yell. The girls cheer and clap. They practice forming a celebratory pyramid out of their bodies while I rinse the halves in the river and lay them in a water-filled pan, filleted like a pigeon with no wings. Then they form themselves into a line behind me, each in turn using my pole to catch a fish, the knives that Cherry carries to splice them, and then the extra pots and pans to hold the berries that they are also plucking from between the barbs of the overflowing bushes. Bernice spends the entire length of the line trying to shoot a fish with an arrow that she has tethered to her ankle. By the end of her wait, Bernice has caught the biggest fish, nearly as long as her leg. It takes three girls to chop it into pan-sized pieces. All right, I call to them. We've got more than we can eat. Let's go share. We leave the park behind and find an old man among a group of squatters who is willing to meet my eyes. The girls keep theirs lowered to the pavement, clutching their tools like they're strong, but still waiting to just be grabbed. It's a real possibility. We risk a lot to take care of ourselves and others. Maybe our heads will still get bashed. Excuse me, sir. I bow to him. Do you know where we could find a cooking barrel? He squints at the troop of girls and then up at me. Miss, are you a little bit green? No, I gurgle. You look a little bit green. He stands up, brushing himself off. What do you have in those pots there? I help him to his feet and let him peer into the pot that I've carried. He whistles and runs his wrinkled hand over his bald head, exposing his bony arm as he slaps his knee. Ooh, I haven't seen any of those in a while. I was hoping you got yourself some nice chicken steaks. But some of the other squatters might be desperate enough to eat those later, after dark. Anything invisible in a pinch. Sir, I assure you that they are safe. They are healthy, uninfected. They died without their heads being bashed. Look at all of the pink, healthy meat. He steps cautiously farther from the fish pot, but he still leads me to the smoldering fire in his group's cooking barrel. He shoes away the pot-bellied man who is licking the grease from the seasoned grate and offers us use of the barrel. The girls crowd the grill until he has disappeared behind them, and they set about cooking drizzling the fish with a jar of pilfered bacon grease. Whom had they robbed so quickly, and while I thought I'd been watching them? Was anyone missing? Has anyone been grabbed? The fillets crackle and spit, bubbling and hissing, the steam mingling with the river and the unmistakable smell of food. A second ring of people gather outside the ring of girls, held at bay only by the hesitance of the old man who has led us to the cooking barrel. He holds a bucket lid for a plate. He licks his lips all the way around because there are no teeth to get in the way. He can't resist the smell of food, free food. Sir, I call out to him, might you be hungry? I have some food here. It's completely safe. The scientists say so. 
Well, I don't believe a thing from the scientists. They can't even get us back to the moon. But you caught them yourself, you say. Were they slimy? If we had listened to the scientists in the first place, we wouldn't even be in this mess. Maybe they can get us out of it. The fish were not slimy, sir. Tell me again about the color of the meat. Was it green? He inches closer. Pink? Some were white. No gray. They didn't stink. He leans over the cooking barrel. No gray. No green. They smell only of the river. They turned their backs to me. They only wanted to gulp the water, not us. They died of belly wounds. He holds out his plate. The girls cheer, slap him on the back, and pass him a seared slab of flesh. He lifts it to his mouth and takes a bite. He chews it. He smiles. A tear runs down his grizzled sideburns. Thank you. I never thought I would taste trout again. It used to be my favorite. This is a delicious treat. A roar of approval ripples through the group of ragged and emaciated companions. They all produce their makeshift plates. I step out of the way so that the girls can cook and serve the hungry crowd. Neighboring squatters skirt the edges of the mob until they realize that they are welcome, and then they hand over what they had worked out for the day. Half bags of soft, shrilled potatoes, brown onions, dried beans, tender rat loins, and squirrel marinated in salt and raisins. Everyone who appeared is given at least a little bit of food, a strip of fish, and a spoonful of whichever side dish has just finished simmering. From my place, standing on top of an old banana crate, I can see the full eaters reclining against the bricks in the back of the alley and the, and the line of wide-eyed new guests that hold their makeshift plates out for a scoop from the girls. Two dark figures bob and weave just out of my line of sight, their heads appearing and disappearing and out of the food line. I gulp. Rangers. One of them approaches the happy eater and handcuffs her. But I shake my head. They aren't rangers with handcuffs. They are cart Kite and Carlos trying orange bands of fabric onto the arms of everyone who will let them. They see me and pick their way through the crowd, wearing backpacks full of tangled orange fabric. Kite hands one to me. Looks like your idea worked. She kisses me on the cheek. This will get us tons of publicity. The radio shows might even notice us. Sorry about before. We're sober now. Carlos adds, trying, tying an orange band onto my arm. The orange bands are stained with the same blue ink as Kite's fingers. There's a raised girl's fists with a hammer in it, and Carlos produced a new stack of green flyers. Kite has carved and then printed a smiling fish with a bow on its head and lipstick across its mouth. Fish are fine. Don't sell your daughters for food. The brave old man who tried the fish first rushes over and grabs one, his orange armband streaking through the night air. He holds it up above his head, thrashing it back and forth. You hear that? We feed girls around here. We don't sell them, right? We all clap until our hands burn and we dance to the tune of somebody's harmonica until the fish are all gone. Then Carlos scoops Sylvia into his arms, counts the head of his other daughters, and promises them that he will read them a good night story after they all have their teeth brushed. Sylvia waves good night, and I blow kisses to the troop as they trundle for the safe house. On our way home, Kite takes me up to an empty rooftop that we've never been on before. We find a row of repaired chairs between two pots of jasmine and lilacs that somebody is tending, and we sit down. We can see all of the stars. We kiss and laugh, and we still stink of baking fish, so Kite helps me out of my sagging tank tops. You did a great job with our friends today. She coos into my ear, and she bites it a little bit. You are one bitchin' badass who is really cool, catching on to raising awareness. Yeah, and of science with your art, everyone working together. You didn't even have to Molotov cocktail anyone. She laughs and kneels at my feet. She wraps her arms around my knees and drags me to the roof to ravish me between the fragrant blossoms. She looks up happily, her hair mussed, chin dripping with me. I love you, I murmur. She tenses between my knees, but I hold her arms tightly against me. I whisper into her neck, Friends can be family. You are my family. Let me raise awareness for you. 
She thrashes out of my grip. She stands up and stomps away from me, clothing herself more quickly than she should have been able to. Why do you have to ruin this too? Family is nothing. We're just friends, if that. Just co-workers, maybe. Roommates. She disappears. I lay with my back on the roof until a small pile of jasmine petals gathers on my exposed belly. I brush them off and stand up to get dressed, alone in the dark. Happy story time.